As an island race, we have always fished the seas around us. Fishing boat shapes have evolved over hundreds of years from coast to coast to cope with local seas and race the fish back to the busy markets, like this one at Brixham in the 1930s. This is my boat, she's Ocean Pearl. She's a Scottish fishing boat. She was built right back in 1933 and fished right through until 1967 when she became a pleasure boat. After a while, however, she ended up in London and was actually on a bonfire. That's when I got hold of her and I transported her down to Coombe's boatyard to do some serious work. She's been out of the water for over 20 years, but my aim is to get her sailing again as soon as possible. Well, the first thing to do was remove the concrete which had been put inside when she was built. The concrete provided ballast to weigh her down in the water and make her nice and steady. Also, it gave you a really nice hard-working platform, so when she was a fishing boat, the fish and the ice and so on coming down below into this fish hold, being stored away, gave a nice hard platform and also a clean floor to clean up afterwards. That concrete had provided a rot trap. The timber had shrunk as she'd been out of the water for 20 years, and allowed the rainwater in, the wood had become softened, and this meant that pretty much all the frames in this area here needed replacing. These big frames here are joined together by the futtocks, which are the thinner pieces in between. These also need a lot of replacement. This took quite a while. I also replaced the keelson that you can see running through the centre here. This is the backbone of the boat. You've got this large one on the inside. There's a keel on the outside. So you end up with a bit of a girder, really, with the frames in between providing the spacer. It's a very strong structure. Also, I replaced the stem and the apron, which is the piece behind the stem, and also the stern post and the stern apron. After that, it was time for a much easier job, the planking. So far, I've replaced over 600 feet of planking, and I'm now on the last one. I've removed the rotten section, but the rest must also be taken out. I'm going to remove this, this old plank here and replace it right to the front. And obviously the plank's already been taken out at the front, but we're going to take it right back to here because we don't really want to join here. It's very important on a boat to get uh, the shift of butts correctly. Now a butt is when two planks, as in here, join together like that and they're covered behind with a butt strap. So, well, there's nothing wrong with this timber, we're going to chop it back, right back to where the original join is, plus a little bit further. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Good for another 50 years. Get that in there. Get a wedge behind it so it comes out without doing any damage. With the old plank removed, the next job was to tack into place a template known as a spiling batten. OK, so the spiling batten is on here, that's good. It's nice and flat, lovely. Right, what we've done is we've removed the old plank and we've cleaned up both the edges of the adjacent planks and we're going to make a pattern. And we're using this thin, bendy ply here, which is allowed to lay naturally onto the side of the boat. And uh, we're going to transfer the pattern onto a larger, heavier piece of timber, which will be the new plank. So, first thing we're going to do, now this spiral batten is up, a little piece of wood, which is parallel sided, square edged, um, or a dummy stick, and we're going to stick it right on the edge of the plank. We're making some marks, so we're getting a distance off each edge. Firstly, on the bottom, we're making a little mark, so when we get up to the timber, we can tell that it's the bottom edge. You make all these marks and when you get up there they mean nothing at all. Okay, so what we've done is we've, we've taken the pattern off the boat, we've placed it onto the timber that's going to become the new plank. What we're going to do now is reverse the procedure that we did earlier on and transfer the lines that we made from the spile board onto the timber. You can see there's some I've done already. So now we're going to do this side, which is over here, put the dummy stick on, line it up and accurately as we can 
comes in line. I'll have to get it right first time with that circular saw. To cut the gentle curve, I lift the saw so less blade length is cutting the wood. It also stops me cutting through the trestle. The electric planer is a great labour saving device. Within 10 minutes the plank's planed up to size. Now that we've cut the plank out, we've planed up to the pencil lines on the edges and we've also cleaned the top of the plank up. And you can now see the subtle tapering shape that's going to fit the boat. And also the little sub subtle humps and bumps which fit the humps and bumps on the boat. We hope. So the next stage now is to take it and stick it into the steam box. We've got to steam it because in order to make wood really bendy and soft and silly, you get it nice and nice and hot and this allows the fibres of the wood to stretch and compress and to get the twist of the plank that we need to get around the front of the boat. So we're going to put it into this little wooden box here which is connected to a steamer. Now traditionally a steamer was a, 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 an old gas bottle with a fire underneath it or a gas burner. Um, that's quite a bit of kit to have but what you can buy now really quite cheaply is this wonderful device which is a wallpaper stripper and they're about 30 or 40 quid fill them up with water plug them in and they'll produce steam for about an hour and a half get this plank in the box I leave it in there for about an hour, by which time the larch will be pliable enough to shape round the hull. Whilst Ocean Pearl was fishing in the cruel waters of the North Sea, down here in Brixham, Devon, Vigilance was working the seas of the south coast. She's long since been replaced by modern diesel trawlers, so now she pays away by carrying tourists rather than fish. Ocean Pearl was built with a motor, but Vigilance was powered only by her sails. And the first job on leaving Brixham Harbour was to extend the bowsprit. A retracting bowsprit meant she was much more handy in a crowded harbour, as her overall length was much shorter. Right, let me clink this one off. These days, Vigilance has an engine, but once we're clear of the harbour, this will be turned off. The first job is to hoist the mizzen, which is the smallest sail at the stern of the boat. Next is the mainsail. Then it's the jib. Before setting the sails, it's bundled with garden twine all the way along to stop it flapping while being hoisted. The staysail is then hoisted behind the jib. Finally, with a sharp tug, the jib is freed by breaking the twine. Unfortunately, not all the twine breaks, so I'm asked by the skipper to free it off. If I fall off, you're all come and get me, won't you? A bit of a twist. This was followed by another technical hitch. There's a wire caught up there, so I'm just, uh, I've been sent along by the skipper here to uh, just unhitch it. The winds are so light today, there was just one more sail at our disposal to give us some extra speed. The topsail. Unfortunately, a cable has jammed, so my second mission of the day is to free it off. Rigging's, rigging's a bit slacker, but oh, what's going on here then? Hey, it's dead windy up here. Oh, there we are. Let's cut that off. Better get down because the topsail's on its way up. It's all a bit wobbly. This topsail goes right up between the top of the mainsail 
and the top mast fills in the triangle in between to give us a bit, bit, bit more horsepower in these light winds. That's relatively easy now, but imagine doing this in a gale of wind. The North Sea, we're out on the western approaches. Swell and wind and waves. Thanks. Thanks. Vigilance, this beautiful Brixham trawler, used to be owned by a personal hero of mine, Ken Harris. Over 15 years, he single-handedly restored her and sailed her for another 25 years. About five years ago, he said, enough is enough, and getting a bit old, and he sold her to a consortium in Brixham who charter her and keep her memories alive. This is the wind direction the old men love for trawling. Right. Because going down towards Stark, Stark Bay, yeah. in that area, so westerly wind is off the land, right. so they have good winds, uh, smooth seas, right. and a good trawling ground. Still good fishing in Lyme Bay, is it? Well, comparatively so. We won't go into the politics. Right. <laughs> right. uh, but they didn't just fish in, in oh, Lyme no, no, Bay, no. they went far and wide. They did, yes, they did, certainly. Uh, and and uh, in the summer, uh, this time of the year, normally the, the winds would be very light airs. Yeah. And so, uh, no good for trawling, so the trawlermen would put their families and furniture on board right. and they would sail up to Lowestoft and especially to Whitby in Yorkshire right. and then they would live ashore in a cottage there for the summer and slowly they opened up the fishing grounds of the North Sea. But really they would go wherever the fish were and wherever there were good winds. Right, and they need the good winds to tow the trawl. Exactly. Though they, they trawled with the tide always, they still needed a very good breeze uh, to get the trawl to work properly, right. to get the right speed in the, in the trawl. Right. So, so there's obviously there's no engine in the boat? No, there's no engine when this was a trawler. Right. No. But they did have a steam winch. Now Vigilance doesn't have her steam winch anymore because she's got no nets to haul. But what she does have is a sucking great anchor and anchor chain to get out. And to help the crew do that, she's got a lovely new hydraulic winch. So how exactly does that work? The winch is still the original winch from the last generation we had a Lister diesel engine which right. drove a hydraulic pump yeah. and that meant fed to this hydraulic valve and through these controls we operated the winch. Right. This became very temperamental, this yes. Lister diesel engine and because we got a generator on board giving us 230 volts we then upgraded ourselves to a 3 horsepower electric hydraulic power pack. We have a 3 horsepower electric motor bolted directly onto a hydraulic pump which is immersed in the oil reservoir at the bottom. And this then feeds hydraulic oil through that system to this valve. These levers operate this valve and drives, drives the winch through the gearing we have in, in here. We also use it for hauling up the, the main halyard and if we're light-handed we've got very few people on board because that is set so it comes along under the deck. We'll go around that capstan but then it's a long process whereas Earlier today, we got it up fairly swiftly right. with your help. If the generator fails and this doesn't work, you can still wind it up. We're by still hand. back to hand. Yes, we have. Right. We have the hydraulic ha the handles here, the like that handles, one. Yep. Put it on there, and we can do it by manpower. The same as we did for getting the bow spread out earlier on today. Right. So we're at the Excelsior Trust Yard in Lowestoft, and we've actually found a steam capstan. It's even got its maker's plate, Elliot and Garrod Limited, engineers and boilermakers from Beckles. Put that up there. So you can see here, there's a couple of pistons which go up and down. These control the valves. This in turn spins this shaft on this axis, which goes down to a bevel gear, and then a crown wheel which runs right around the top of this big drum. So this rotates. So it's an awesomely powerful device to have on deck. They use it for pulling up the trawl warp, but could also use it for any sort of power they needed, so hoisting the mainsail, getting the boat into a dock. This is actually one of the last ones that was built in 1923, but when they came in, in the 1870s, it was a very controversial machine, because basically it caused the loss of three jobs per boat. And because of that, there were riots in Lowestoft, the capstan riots, where people complained that they were losing their jobs to make way for one of these. The steam capstan would have been fished on the deck about here, and the trawl warp coming over the side of the boat, round the capstan, would go off down this hatch here, be flaked out beautifully, by a small boy. That's me. <coughs> now the trawl wall would come down this hatch and have to be flaked out on the floor. 
It was five inches in circumference, freezing cold, soaking wet, and they got a young lad to do the job. Now by the time it was totally flaked out and full, there wouldn't be much room for the lad above, and he'd be in big trouble if when it went to pay out again, it got knotted. So it was a very, very important job. After tea, there was a real treat for the crew of Vigilance. This is the Brixham lifeboat. It's been up to full for repairs. She's on her way home. A lot of people like looking at old boats and look as though they're coming over to have a look. It's so wicked. Look at that. That'll make a nice sight for just falling off your ship and see that coming towards you. You know that Britain is the only country in the world that gets its lifeboat paid for with voluntary donations. You can see we've got the mainsail fully up. If the wind was to get up too much, we'd have to reef the sail. Lower the sail slightly, and you see small lines on the end gather up all the loose stuff at the bottom and stop it flapping around and getting in the way. There's also some funny furry things there. They look a bit like mop heads. And they're called baggy wrinkle. What the baggy wrinkle does is to stop the chafe and the wear and tear on the sail. And the topping lift, the line that holds the boom up, is running diagonally across it. Now, without the baggy wrinkle, that would very slowly seesaw its way through the sail, and you end up with two sails. But a bit of baggy wrinkle there, keeps it apart, and the sails last forever. The Vigilance carries two types of anchor. Here we can see a CQR, or it's otherwise known as a plough anchor. You can see how it's sharp point, will dig into sand, mud, or shingle. But over here is a fisherman's anchor. That's what most people think of as your classic anchor. Now that's far better for use in seaweed or rock, where the spike, the hook, or the fluke cuts through the weed and gets a grip. Back in the workshop, the final plank for Ocean Pearl is thoroughly steamed and ready to be fitted. The plank's been cooking in the steamer for about an hour. And in a minute, we're going to whip it out and we're going to clamp it to the plank above, using the plank above as, as a pattern to cramp to. It's, a, it's not the same curve as the one below, but it's pretty similar. So we've set the cramps up ready. We're going to bring it up, cramp it in the middle, sweep it round, and to get the twist on it, to get more twist than we actually need, we're going to put some wedges on the bottom, cramp on top, to really get a nice bit of shape into it. Because when you take it off and it starts to cool, it will spring back very slightly. Within a couple of minutes, so you've got to get this done as soon as you can. That's about right, actually. Um, and then leave it for about an hour, let it cool off, take it down, and it should stay like it. Good luck. Three months later, Ocean Pearl is out of the shed and ready to be launched. We're using the traditional greasy boards method to move her from the shed towards the water. As she inches forward, my friend Sophie is helping to shift the greasy boards from behind her to into her path. This is the traditional way of moving boats and goes right back to the way the Egyptians moved the stones to make the pyramids. Now we've got to move those boards from that ballast and I'll back out. This is definitely a team effort and I've managed to rope in most of my friends to help. The trick is to go just too far so you can't quite get out. Once I've pulled her as far as I can, I drive Betsy, the tractor, round to the bow to push her. As we wait for high water, we put plenty of grease on the slipway to ensure she doesn't get stuck. 
This is a critical bit as I move her to the top of the slipway. From the tractor, you can't see the two greasy ways I must position her onto, so I'm relying on directions from my helpers. None of them have done this before, so it requires a lot of toing and froing to get it right. The next job is to put the ballast onto the cradle supporting it. This slides into the water with a boat, but must fall away from the hull and sink. Barnaby is putting a load of cast iron onto the cradle to ensure this happens. Meanwhile, Marcus gives the antifoul a few finishing touches. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Tessa. It's been a hectic last few weeks, and I've had an incredible crew. It's very exciting because it, she hasn't been afloat for 20 years. I hope she floats. Right, should we get it wet? Should we get it wet? Thank you. Here we go. <laughs> a bit for you, dog. And a little bit for the sea. Keep it happy. And we need to tie her on with a rope. Because otherwise, she's going to go wayward. A rope. Oh, no, no, how about this? With a tug from Betsy, the cradle is released. And for the first time in over 20 years, Ocean Pearl is back where she belongs, in the sea. Now, the moment of truth. Is she letting in any water? It's a miracle! <laughs> No, I mean, there really, really is it. Well, she floats, climbing. That's great, isn't it? The next stage is to get the decks on and to fit her out, but not today.